morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio, the podcast where we talk with writers about their lives, their craft, their business, and their latest work. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and our podcast is sponsored by Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a literary nonprofit whose programs include the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas. Come visit Bookmarks at our community gathering space and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Inside the Writer's Studio is also proud to be an affiliate of Libro FM, the audiobook platform that supports your local independent bookstore. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information on Libro FM and a special offer. My guest today is Kate Alice Marshall, whose thriller What Lies in the Woods has just been published. Kate, welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we delve into the book, which I'm going to really enjoy delving into because I love this read, um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself and and uh, how you came to the writing life. Uh, sure. Well, I have pretty much always wanted to be a writer. My mom is a writer, and I think that the first time that I declared that I was going to be a novelist, I was about four years old. <laughs> And uh, she's kept my first quote unquote short story, which I, I think is written on the back of a phone bill <laughs> and uh, says, Bill and Susie found a treasure. They were very happy. The end. <laughs> and since then, um, it's been pretty much my favorite thing to do and what I've been working towards uh, as my profession since I had an inkling of uh, the idea that I needed a profession at all. And when I was a teenager, I started taking things a bit more seriously and trying to write for publication. Uh, and after that, it was mostly a matter of just maturing and uh, my writing maturing and learning what I wanted to write and uh, trying over and over again until something clicked. And here I am today. <laughs> you said I'm intrigued by what you said about learning what you wanted to write. How how does a young writer learn what they want to write? Well, when I was young, all the way through uh, elementary school and middle school and high school, I basically only read science fiction and fantasy. It was my very favorite thing. And I assumed that that would be what I wrote. And that was, at the time, what I was interested in writing. But as I got older, I started to, uh, you know, discover that there are more books in the world and that I was interested in elements of stories that lent themselves to other genres more. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a very slow process of realizing that the books that I was putting a ton of effort and heart into weren't what I wanted to be working on long term. And so one of the major things that led to my becoming published was actually figuring out that uh, I was more drawn to a type of story I hadn't considered before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm going to go slightly off topic here because before we started, we commented that we each have dogs in the room with us. <laughs> um, and I'll admit that sometimes I do a little online stalking of people before I interview them. We can call it research. That sounds better than <laughs> research. Um, and I discovered that you have a dog uh, named after an author whom I very much admire. Um, you have a dog named Vonnegut. Tell us about Vonnegut and, and how, <laughs> why you decided to name your dog after Kurt Vonnegut. I'm guessing after Kurt Vonnegut. Yes, uh, he is named after Kurt Vonnegut and his his little sister is Octavia Pupler. Uh, we chose Vonnegut because he is one of my husband's favorite authors and uh, an author I've enjoyed and particularly enjoyed. You know, he has a lot of really great uh, quotes and small uh, speeches and things like that. You know, he was eminently quotable. And so uh, I, I have some fondness for Vonnegut as well. And we we sort of stumbled into it sideways. We were trying to find just like sounds of names we liked and we came up with Vaughn and thought that if we lengthened that to Vonnegut, it would make a great, <laughs> great I mean, full a, name, Vonnegut D. Marshall. That's a great, a great dog name. Um, well, let's turn to What Lies in the Woods. Uh, this is, book just came out about a week or so ago. 
Um, and I, as I said, I thought this was a really riveting read. I, I don't pass every book that I read on the podcast on to my wife, but this one, I was like, yeah, she's going to like this for sure. Um, so tell us just, you know, obviously one of the issues with talking about a thriller, and I've had this issue in, in my own life lately with, with my most recent novel is, you know, how do we talk about it without, without spoiling it, without spoilers. Right. So to the extent that you're able to, um, you know, tell us the basic setup of, of the story and how, how we're going to begin. Sure. So What Lies in the Woods is the story of Naomi and her two best friends from childhood. And uh, when they are 11 years old, they spend the summer playing what they call the goddess game, which is this intensely imaginative and magical game that they're playing out in the woods. And uh, in the in the midst of this game, they come across a uh, they stumble onto kind of a shocking discovery. And instead of telling anyone about it, which would be the responsible thing to do, they decide to make it sort of the center of this game and this story that they're telling. Uh, and then at the end of the summer, Naomi is attacked and she survived survives this attack and the three of them, end up testifying against the man that they identify as the attacker and they send him to prison. But in the midst of all of that, they decide that because they could get in trouble and their, their testimony and their character could be questioned if people knew that they had been hiding this secret in the woods, they're never going to tell anyone about it. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years later, the man who attacked Naomi has died in prison and one of her friends says, okay, well, now it's time to tell people what we were really doing out there. And they're not all happy about that decision and uh, the consequences of questioning whether it's time to finally speak up, start to spiral out of control very quickly. Right, right. So this this book is described as your debut adult thriller. You've written YA books, you've written, written middle grade books, I think. Um, what made you want to, at this point in your career, to move to a slightly different kind of book? And and how is this book, do you think, connected to things that you've written in, in the past? I love writing in all three age categories that I'm working in right now. And each of them really brings something different uh, as a story and to me as a writer. And I always knew that I wanted to get back to writing adult fiction uh, on in, in some capacity. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what that would end up looking like. And then I got this idea. It had actually been kicking around in my head for a long time as a young adult idea and not coming together about the, the three girls in the woods mm -hmm. uh, who find something. And it wasn't until I realized that the story that I really wanted to tell was about them as adults yeah. that it came to life. And then I just chased that story idea. And I enjoyed writing the book so much that I was confident that I wanted to write more afterward, which is uh, has always been one of my deciding factors, uh, because I, I tend to, I describe myself as a little bit of a magpie. I uh, read something I love and I want to write something like it. So I sort of flit around finding shiny new subgenres to play in, but I need to be sure that I want to actually stick with them long term in order to actually go through the effort of writing an entire book and trying to sell it. But I loved writing this one so much that I felt pretty confident that I was ready to add that to my, my stable. Mm -hmm. um, and it is very similar to my other books in other age categories in the sense that I wrote all of them and I have a, uh, an aesthetic and, um, a voice that carries through them. I'm interested in the same sorts of characters and emotional journeys, but because of what each category focuses on, they are very distinct as well. And that gives me a kind of freedom that I find very alluring. <laughs> in my middle grade, I tend to uh, write funnier things and a little bit lighter spooky things. And that gives me a chance to really just enjoy myself and uh, be very sincerely emotional in a way that only preteens can be. And then with young adult, 
they tend to be, you know, coming of age stories and finding yourself as who you're going to be uh, as you enter adulthood. And there are, uh, it's a transitional state that has a lot of power to it. Uh, and then in the adult space, I mean, you just have characters who have so much more depth of history to them that it opens up new avenues of storytelling. So each each age group has its own core themes and strengths uh, as a storytelling medium. And uh, but you know, I can't change my bones. So moving between them, I'm often drawn to the same kinds of imagery and the same kinds of relationships and things like that, but seen through different lenses. Well, um, as I said, we don't want to spoil things for our listeners because I think they're going to really enjoy the twists and turns of this novel. So we're probably going to focus a lot on the beginning of the book. Um, and so to go back to what you said earlier, this book begins um, not with a young girl being attacked, not with uh, the conviction of someone for that attack, but 20 years later with the with the death of that person who was convicted for the attack. And it's a moment that in a lot of stories would be would be the end, would be closure. Um, why did you choose that moment as th that moment that feels like an ending to be the beginning? It's the moment that disrupts the balance that they have created, these three, these three women now, uh, because he was the reason that they were keeping the secret. He was the excuse that they had to say, uh, you know, we can't tell people about this because then what if they started asking questions? What if they decided that they didn't believe us? And then this horrible man who is suspected of being a serial killer uh, would go free and he could hurt other people. So that's that means that we can't tell anyone, which also means that we can excuse ourselves for not telling anyone about uh, what we found. And once he's gone, they have to ask themselves those questions again and face up to the decision that they made. Uh, and it's no longer uh, an easy answer. So they have to revisit their choices and their relationship as uh, a friend group. And so that seemed like the really clear moment at which this precarious balance that they had struck for 20 years would suddenly be upended. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like the, the opening few pages of this book were almost an, a beautifully done exercise in point of view. Talk to us a little bit about, about how you use point of view in your writing and, and in this novel in particular. So I think you're referring to the fact that the the very first chapter, uh, it's a little bit of a prologue and mm -hmm. it uh, it is something of an omniscient point of view and something of a uh, collective point of view between the three girls as it talks about uh, the, the day that their game ends and the day of the attack. Uh, and that was the first thing that I wrote because I really needed to capture the sense of their group and their group identity and how strong that was to the point where uh, it was uh, a, a shared experience and one that they uh, created a collective <clears throat> memory for. And there's a lot in the book which is about the unreliability of memory and the way that uh, how we tell ourselves the story of what happened changes how we remember it. Mm -hmm. And so it goes into what stories other people tell about that day and how it shapes how the girls are regarded. Uh, so I wanted to touch on all of those themes right away. And I wanted to create an almost dreamlike sense to match the power of the magic that they created for themselves with their with their game and their determination to uh if not actually believe to pretend to believe what they were doing and so that opening is really about uh 
what that summer was all about and the way that it rippled forward into their lives. And then we go right into Naomi's first person point of view uh, 20 years later, and uh, it's very limited and it's all about her subjective experience, but it has been shaped by all of the things that other people have told her and have all the stories people have told about her. Yeah. When we first meet Naomi, she's living with um, this guy named Mitch. He's a writer. Uh, we get the sense that he uses her scars in his fiction. Um, do you, I mean, I, I'm just hoping that you're not Mitch, but I'm curious about <laughs> to what extent you sort of observe the people around you to use in your writing and find a a, a nicer way to do it than, than Mitch does. <laughs> uh, you know, I, when I, use details from people around me. I very much try to be selective in what I use and completely recontextualize it because I don't like the sense that I could be a Mitch who's using someone else's <laughs> story. But, you know, you learn to write convincing people by studying the people around you and studying people that you read about. And so, you know, I'll I'll try to uh, you know, if I think that there is a pattern of uh, of employment or of failed relationships that I think work for a character, I'll try to take the the most boiled down essential version of it and then uh, recontextualize it with details and uh, uh, a different configuration of like, okay, if I if I'm interested in how this person kind of uh, and this is a completely invented uh, example. If someone like blew up their career and uh, ended up flaming out, and they were a uh, worked in finance or something, then I'll find a way to make uh, a character who does something similar and makes similar kinds of decisions. But they'll be a different gender. They'll be an artist, something like that. So I'm taking whatever the thing is that's interesting and trying to figure out what the the lowest unit of that is and then mm -hmm. build it back up so that you don't recognize real people and so that I can make uh, decisions about the, the character without it being a commentary on the real person. Yeah. I also find it's interesting that Mitch, Mitch is a writer and Naomi is a photographer um, and they have, there's some discussion early on about the relationship between the artist and the art. Um, Naomi says, I don't want to turn my trauma into art. Um, what is there something essential about the creative life that you're trying to get at with these, with these two characters? Uh, I think Mitch is in there as a very immediate and ongoing, uh, uh, reflection of what Naomi has experienced her whole life with the way that people want to take her story and make it their own uh, or who view her as primarily the thing that happened to her. Uh, and there, <laughs> I will uh, admit that a lot of Mitch is in there because I, <laughs> I was enjoying kind of skewering uh, my own profession and our own worst impulses as writers. Uh, but he also makes a really great contrast to how Naomi is uh, artistic. She's in an artistic profession, but what she's interested in is creating beauty for other people and letting them own their own stories. And he is more of a uh, a hungry person who wants to, take other people's uh what's interesting about other people and use it to aggrandize himself in part because he doesn't have any faith that he himself is interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so even though i think the vast majority of us were not attacked by killers when we were children <laughs> um there's still a universality in the way that childhood friendships uh, evolve or in some cases don't evolve into adult relationships. Can you talk about how you illustrate the differences between the, the way these three characters relate to each other as children and the way they relate to each other 20 years later as, as adults? Yeah, it was a really interesting 
challenge and an interesting process. I think that these three girls, they were incredibly close as kids, but if nothing traumatic had happened, it's very likely that they might have drifted apart as they grew older and they grow into very different people, but they have this central thing that keeps them together. And so writing them as adults was, uh, it was this constant back and forth process for me of figuring out who they were and then how they could have evolved into those people. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about the things that had happened between in the intervening 20 years and letting that uh, move forward and influence the way I wrote them as adults. So it was this, this constant shuttling back and forth of, of trying to uh, imagine this very long tale of these relationships and how they were tangled together and drifted apart and came together again over and over again. Um, and uh, they, uh, as kids, they have uh, more of a um, dynamic relationship, I think, they were more close, they were more sort of jockeying for leadership or for uh, each other's friendship, and they changed between, uh, you know, a particular pair of them being closer than the others um, from time to time. And then as adults, they've sort of settled into their roles in the friend group. And so Cassidy has viewed, always viewed herself as the leader and the caretaker and the competent one. And Olivia is more reserved and uh, she's the one who is more in trouble, more often needs taken care of. And then Naomi is the one who's left. And uh, so that has sort of uh, ossified them and made them into these uh, more solidified positions, which then, of course, are ready to be disrupted by the events at the beginning of the book. I uh, So there are a lot of minor characters in this book, I say minor, secondary characters, who uh, many of whom are not what they appear. Uh, I think we, since we we're reading a thriller, it's safe to know that, but um, <laughs> we won't we won't give away any of their secrets. But one of the ones that intrigued me in particular was um, this young man who was a podcaster. And the, the reason that really stuck out for me is that as someone who hosts a podcast, I thought, I'm not sure I've seen a podcaster in a novel before. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that this is the first one, but but talk a little bit about, um, you know, just the, just the art of setting a book in today when things are changing so rapidly you know, I can remember writing a book and and putting present day on the chapters and thinking, oh God, what if by the time <laughs> it's published, people aren't sending text messages anymore? You know, um, talk a little bit about about how you sort of tried to incorporate the present in, in this in this narrative. Uh, you know, that is always a concern of mine, and I've mostly uh, solved it by always setting my books like a year before I started writing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I often won't state what the actual year is, but you can figure it out through doing, you know, math from offhand comments and stuff. So I think that this one is technically set in like, uh, oh, and I set it right before the pandemic. So I didn't have yeah. to think about that, any that's of another that, big that issue. Yeah, we have to deal with. Uh, so I, I can cheat a little bit with that, but uh, as far as using a podcaster, uh, I think that they've become a lot more popular in thrillers these days, in part because it's the the new nosy journalist. Yeah. And I know for me, I find it appealing to use a podcaster instead of a, uh, like a newspaper journalist, uh, because Anyone can call themselves a podcaster. Yes, <laughs> you know, true. you don't need a degree or an organization backing you that might uh, take responsibility for your actions. And so there is a wider range of possibilities of what you're going to get out of that character. Yeah. Uh, and it also, uh, it, it allows you to sort of personalize what you're saying about them through their content uh, because there are so many different 
forms and styles and attitudes in podcasting and it can be very personal and personalized and so I enjoyed the the idea of constructing who this guy is through looking at his content yeah and I feel like I mean I think anytime in a in a situation like this the with if you have the journalist you're never quite sure what are the motives is does the journalist care about the protagonist want to help them out or are they just in it for the story and as you said when it's a when it's a podcaster that just sort of amplifies that even more because there's there's less sort of built-in ethics in, in exactly. podcasting than there would yeah. be if it was somebody who was a reporter from the new york times or something you know? um, so we've talked about this in the podcast um many times before but thrillers and mysteries are to a large extent about the art of managing information when do you tell us things you know how do you how do you balance the need to keep the reader curious um with the danger of having them be confused or or no knowing too much or not knowing enough how did how do you deal with that as a writer um yourself you know sort of keeping that balance of of information flow so that the reader wants to continue turning the page um but doesn't know too much too soon yeah it's always a really interesting question and challenge when approaching a new mystery and trying to figure out what you can keep from the reader just practically and then there's always a question of, uh, is it going to be more impactful if this is revealed later and you're surprised and you recontextualize what happened? Or is it going to be more powerful to have the dramatic information up front mm -hmm. so that you understand what's going on? And that's one of the things that I play with the most in sort of my second draft when I've got everything, when I know what all the reveals are, and then I'm playing with uh, what, whether I've withheld something that is actually to the detriment of the drama, mm -hmm. uh, or whether something needs to be withheld longer, uh, and then just playing with the little places where you can uh, tip off a clever reader with a particular phrase or withhold something by being a little bit ambiguous in a way that's not going to totally infuriate people. Uh, so that that's always just uh, the the sort of fiddly final steps for me in a second draft. And I find that at a certain point, uh, as the writer, you just sort of start to go mad trying to track like, well, is the reader going to think this or are they going to realize that it's too obvious and so discount it? Oh, but then it becomes obvious again. And like <laughs> you, you start just like going in loops and trying to construct yeah. versions of readers' brains and like layer after layer of, ah, but then they'll figure out that this twist is too obvious to be the twist. And then that twist seems like it isn't obvious. So they'll assume that it's that one. So I'll make it more obvious, no less obvious, which will trick them. <laughs> you can just sort of chase your tail forever on that. Yeah. Well, we, you know, I've talked about this with, with groups talking about um, my novel, The Enigma Affair. And that is this idea that there's kind of this unwritten pact between the writer of a thriller and the reader that the reader wants to guess what the twists are. But secretly, the reader wants to be wrong. They, they want to be surprised. And so, right, yeah. so they kind of will fall into that, uh, you know, for you um, in, in a way that, that can be helpful to the writer. One thing I will, I will say to readers of this book, if you want to see masterful management of information and not giving away things too soon, but hinting at stuff, just look at the way she talks about the smell of gasoline. I'm not going to say anything else, but like, that's pretty cool the way she does that. <laughs> um so Naomi worries that people are going to think she and her friends, this is when she's, when they're young, when they're 11 years old, she's going to think that they, people are going to think that they are, and I'm quoting here, strange, wicked little beasts. And then she goes on to say, and we were, what little girl isn't? What are the essential attributes of being an 11 year old girl um, that you're trying to, to show in these characters in, in the, in the childhood portion of, of the book? 
Well, I want to be clear that I'm not sure that I agree with Naomi that all <laughs> little girls are strange, wicked little beasts, but I think that there's a little bit of strangeness and wickedness in most children just because uh, you, as a child, haven't solidified your view of the world as much, and it doesn't necessarily match up with adult assumptions or adult morality you're still figuring out what is acceptable and uh, whether you want to uh, live your life acceptably. And uh, anyone who has little kids in particular knows that they tend to say things that are very kind of startling and uh, can make you quite unsettled if you don't remind yourself like, that they don't know about the world. They don't understand about things like uh, death and manners. And so they tend to come out with very uh, unique perspectives. And at the age where uh, Naomi and her friends are playing this game at 11, they're on the cusp of leaving childhood and they, uh, she describes it as knowing that they're sort of too old to be doing the things that they're doing and believing the things that they believe, but they're not ready to let go of it yet. And so they're holding on to it even tighter. And there's a desperation not to leave behind the world that they've created for themselves that leads them to make choices that would be uh, potentially horrifying to adults. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Thomas Will famously said, you can't go home again. And in some ways, Naomi, even though she is the one who's moved out of this, this town where they all knew each other as children, can't seem to escape home, um, which kind of leads me to another secondary character, and, and that is her father. Tell us a little bit about him, how he lives, and, and how that all sort of connects to this, this central trauma of, of Naomi trying to deal with her past. So the most striking thing about Naomi's father is that he is a, uh, a hoarder mm -hmm. and the home that she grew up in, uh, he already was a hoarder, but to a lesser degree, but now she's come home and it's essentially, it's unlivable. It's going to be condemned. And so, uh, practically speaking, she can't, go back to that house, but uh, there's a conflict inside of her because she doesn't want to, and she doesn't want to belong there, but it is still the place where she grew up, and it was the place she always wished was a safe home for her, and now it's become so undeniably unsafe and unlivable that she has to uh, let go of the last scraps of that uh, that place in her soul. And uh, I think that psychologically, <laughs> she does sort of the same thing that her father does, which is she has never dealt with her past or uh, her feelings about her hometown and just layers new problems on top instead. And so what he's doing with all of his stuff, she's very much doing with uh, her own life. And then she discovers at one point that the one room in the house that he has left uh, entirely functional and untouched is her room. And so that place, her place in that disaster is still there and she hasn't entirely uh, closed it off. So I think this, you talked about earlier about in, in YA book about, um, about characters sort of trying to, to find their place and figure out who they are. I, I always think stories of searching for identity are fascinating stories, but it also seems to me that the town in which this book is set is kind of searching for its identity. It's having a, a somewhat of an identity crisis. It's a logging town where logging doesn't happen anymore. Talk about talk about this town, the setting, and and sort of how you how you use that setting to reveal some of these deeper themes of the book. Yeah, the setting was chosen first for the natural world surrounding it. I grew up in uh, the Seattle area and the woods that I played in were right outside suburbs. So, you know, we had 
bears, but we also, <laughs> you know, could go 20 feet to the fridge. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted something where there was a stronger sense of a depth of wilderness and natural world that these girls could feel lost in. And the Olympic Peninsula is full of beautiful places that feel ancient and feel magical. But of course, if you're living out there, uh, the history of the towns there uh, is full of things like they were logging towns and then the logging industry largely shut down. And so it seemed like the perfect opportunity to create a whole community that is in the same sort of shift of identity and the letting go of one era and having to face another one that the girls were. And then when Naomi returns, the town has settled into a new identity that's not necessarily uh, comfortable or clean, uh, you know, cle uh, clearly on one side or the other, but they've kind of figured out what, what they are for now, and that's something she hasn't quite managed for herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, as you said before, the, other than the prologue, this story is written in, in Naomi's first person voice. Tell us about finding her voice. I mean, it's a very powerful narrative voice that that um, and I think that's one of the real keys to telling any story is to getting that getting that voice together. So talk talk about the process of finding her voice and how you sort of knew when you had the right voice to tell this story. Yeah, her voice came to me very early and earlier than I usually settle into a narrative voice. I think because I knew from the start that I wanted to take the opportunity to make her a little rougher around the edges uh, and a little more troubled uh, and spiky and not always 100% sympathetic. And I wanted her to make bad decisions. And so the, but I knew that I wanted to write someone I, I wanted to spend an entire book with. You know, I don't wanna write someone that I hate for a hundred pages or more. And so uh, I just started writing until I found a voice that I found so uh, compelling and, and fierce in her own way that I was willing to uh, stick with her and help her make some poor choices in life and still be rooting for her. Uh, and I really love that uh, she brings uh, a bit of wry and cynical humor. I find that if I'm writing about dark subjects, uh, it really helps me as a writer to be able to uh, have a little bit of gallows humor in there as well. So I, I settled into her voice quite quickly, and I really loved uh occupying her troubled headspace. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm quite relieved to hear you say that you feel that she makes some bad decisions because I, I'm going to have to agree with you on that. <laughs> um, but I, but I'm curious about, I mean, did she, did she ever surprise you with these decisions and how do you, and to what extent do you imagine the reader when you're writing this? I mean, we're out there in our heads going, I mean, this isn't a particular situation for the book, but we're yelling, you know, don't get in the van with the man with the candy, you know. Um, to what extent does that, that knowledge of the reader's reaction play into creating those decisions? And to what extent did, did Naomi make those decisions, you know, kind of slightly out of your control? <laughs> um, I don't think that she ever took any major uh zags from where I intended her to go uh, in this one. It tends to be for me more the secondary characters that really will surprise me with mm -hmm. a uh, change of heart or a line of dialogue that makes me realize that uh, I want to revise them to be someone completely different. For Naomi, my rule was always just that I had to believe that she would do it. Uh, and it's it was never that hard given how uh, emotional and uh, fraught she is. She is doing things out of uh, intense instinct and she's got, uh, you know, fight or flight absolutely in her bones. She wants to stay moving and be doing things 
which means that she doesn't always take the time to slow down and, uh, you know, not go in the basement or <laughs> get in the sketchy van. Uh, so she has a uh, propulsive forward momentum as a person that makes it really easy to get her into trouble. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that the children do as part of this this game, this very elaborate game that they're they're playing um, that last summer, uh, is they name themselves after mythological characters. What what role does mythology play in this novel or or in your writing in general? The mythology in this book is very much a reflection of the games that I played as a kid and the sorts of interests that my friends and I had. We, I, I don't know that we ever got super into Greek mythology in particular, but I remember uh, being obsessed with myths and fairy tales and not just in the content of them, but in the idea of being someone who knew all about uh, myths and history and fairy tales. And it made me feel like a, uh, like I was privy to something special and a little bit secret to know all of these little uh, facts and versions of stories and the origins of Cinderella and things like that. And so I wanted to bring some of that in. And the goddesses to me seemed like a, a, the right place for the age that they are for them to land as something that feels sophisticated enough that it's not really a kid thing. <laughs> they are being goddesses and they're thinking about real world mythology. They're not just playing a kid's game. So it's a, a sort of transition for them and something that they can hold on to for one more summer. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi recalls of this time that she and her friends spent playing these games and acting out these, these fantasies. She says, we knew the world was cruel and dirty and dull, but we refused to accept it. There was magic in the world. We only had to find it. What, what is the magic in the world for you? I have, I think, a very different answer as an adult than I did at, at their age. Uh, I, as I said, I drew a lot on my own childhood and my memories of my feelings around my yearning for something uh, magical, something unreal in the world. And as a kid, it felt like magic, the idea of magical things was so wondrous and appealing that uh, I wasn't willing to not believe in it, even though I never actually would say that I believed in magic. I wanted to believe so much. And I had this sense that if I could believe, then there would be a chance that it might be real. And so there was this effort to hold on to the possibility of something beyond what I could see and know. And I I never really quite grew out of like just wondering if, you know, that strange pair of trees in the woods might be a, a passage to another world if you walked through it. And so that search for magic, I think especially for these three kids, was about there being something meaningful and something that they belonged to and that belonged to them. And, you know, as an adult, I have found plenty of wonder and magic and meaning in things that are, you know, demonstrably true and don't involve uh, sneaking through a wardrobe into Narnia. But I think at, at that age, there is a, uh, a longing for the mystical that is about wanting something beyond yourself and that belongs to just you. 
We like to end every episode of Inside the Writer Studio with the same 10 questions. You should be able to answer each of them in just a few words, but hopefully they'll give us a little insight into you and into your writing. So if you're ready, we will begin. All right. What word do you love to work into your writing? Uh, I love the sound of the word gloaming. Mm. And I've managed to name a magical sword after it in my middle grade series. So I got to use it a lot. What word do you hate to encounter in other people's writing? I hate the word shrill. Okay. Where's your favorite place to write? I have a beautifully newly decorated office where I love to write. Where could you never write? Outside, I think. Mm -hmm. To what rule of grammar do you pay least attention? Commas go where I feel they should go. <laughs> What was the first book you remember reading? There's a book called Animalia, which is full of just wild illustrations. And I remember paging through that for hours at a time. What are you reading now? Uh, right now, I'm reading Astrid Parker Can't Fail, uh, which is a fun romance. What book would you like to have written? The next one that I have to draft, I would love for that to be done already. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of book would you like to write, but probably never will? Mm, someday I would love to get back to finishing uh, some of the epic fantasy that I've started and not finished. And finally, what would you like to hear a reader tell you? I bought 10 copies of your book for all of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> This has been Inside the Writer's Studio. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and my guest today has been Kate Alice Marshall, whose novel What Lies in the Woods is available wherever books are sold. Kate, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Inside the Writer's Studio is sponsored by Bookmarks, a literary nonprofit that runs the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas and operates a community gathering place and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. To find out more about Bookmarks and all its programs, visit www.bookmarksnc.org. Inside the Writer's Studio is proud to be affiliated with Libro FM. Unlike other audio book platforms, Libro FM supports your local independent bookstore. Whether you buy a single book or, like me, a monthly subscription, you can link your account to your local store or to Bookmarks to support literary community. For a special two-for-one offer, go to Libro.fm and use the discount code WRITERS. If you've enjoyed Inside the Writer's Studio, please consider leaving a rating or review online at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Writer's Studio posts new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. On our next episode, I'll be talking with novelist Steve Barry about his new book, The Last Kingdom. Until then, thanks for listening, and may you read with wonder and write with passion. Mm -hmm.